Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Planning for the Recovery, episode five. This is the episode in which we're going to talk exclusively about virtual planning events. That's virtual planning inquiries, virtual planning uh, hearings, and high court cases done virtually uh, in the administrative court. I'm joined, as usual, by the team. Uh, so I'm joined by Thea Osmond-Smith, who's in Shropshire, James Corbett Bircher, who's in London, Jack Smythe, who's at home on his parents' farm in Hertfordshire, and Jan Bucky Thompson, who is in Sussex. Now, we've all been extremely busy over the last couple of weeks, and um, so James and I and Leanne are all going to talk about the virtual inquiries that we've been doing. James and I have been in an inquiry for the last two weeks. Today is the last day we're closing submissions. Um, and Leanne is my junior in the next two cases that I have coming up, and she's been helping me with the case management conferences and the technical meetings and the preparation of all the evidence. Um, then we're going to hear, and that's going to take about 25 minutes, then we're going to hear from uh, Jack, who had a virtual planning hearing this week uh, in Witchhaven, and uh, he's going to talk for about 10 minutes of his experience about that. And then finally, we're going to hear from Jack and Thea, who uh, yesterday both had um, a high court case, the same high court case, they're both on the same side, but for different parties, and they're going to be telling us about how that went as well. So we're going to begin with planning inquiries. And um, on the 13th of May, Robert Jendrick, the Secretary of State, made clear that um, virtual planning inquiries will be the default setting going forward. Um, and uh, we don't know how long that's going to last, but certainly um, for the foreseeable future, that is how planning inquiries will progress. Um, we know that he was encouraging PIMS to progress that, and PIMS also provided their own press release. So now Leanne is going to tell us about that. But PIMS then issued a press release on the 28th of May as well, which confirmed, of course, all of the, the very hard work that they've been doing behind the scenes to try to implement virtual events um, using digital tools in place of face-to-face. And what we therefore know from that is that cases that have been postponed due to COVID specifically are going to be being prioritised. In June specifically, there's going to be 10 planning appeal hearings, eight inquiries uh, as well taking place. Um, the remaining are going to be rearranged at the earliest opportunity. So they'll presumably be, be gotten to as soon as they can be. Now, of course, two of the planning inquiries, um, I'm junior to yourself, Chris, and I know you're currently engaged in one um, with JCB at the moment. Now, given the time of, uh, that understandably it will take to arrange all of those um, inquiries and hearings, PINS has been liaising with parties and, uh, and others that are involved in the events to organise these CMCs. And the purpose of those is, of course, to discuss how, how going virtual is going to work with all of the parties being able to participate. Now, I've had two of these um, with yourself, Chris, so far. Uh, the purpose of that, of course, is to allow uh, the inspector in the case to, to first go through with the parties that are engaged in, in the inquiry, all of the changes to the national guidance and the work that PINS has been doing, um, just so that everybody understands what, what that is, uh, and then going through the practical challenges and, and arrangements for such an inquiry as well. So that's an opportunity, um, Chris, for anyone in the parties to discuss any concerns that they might have with the process, um, to learn from the inspector in brief about the technology that's going to be used for the inquiry itself uh, and also to go through the practical arrangements so things like how the notification letters and site notices are going to be sent out and what they're going to look like and um, looking to the program and how that will work in particular the running order bearing in mind of course um, that the virtual nature of the event things that means that things need to run slightly differently to how they would at inquiry in terms of time slots. Great, super. Thank you very much. And we've got a technical meeting coming up, haven't we, tomorrow uh, on behalf of, uh, of our clients for a Secretary of State case in July. Right, now next, uh, thank you, Leanne. Next, James, the documents. How do we deal with the documents of these virtual events? Chris, so uh, documents, of course, are the lifeblood of any inquiry, be that physical or virtual. And viewers may be asking, do I need to go fully electronic? And if so, how are such documents to be published online? Now, the answer is that you can use paper documents if that works for you. 
However, inspectors are plainly increasingly using electronic documents uh, for the core documents with a much smaller number of paper documents. Now, in all in virtual inquiries to date, the Council have published the documents on a specific web page on their website. And that web page was so accessible in our inquiry last week and this week that the inspector indeed was using that web page to access certain documents. Now, there are potential further changes afoot to documentation and the rules on documentation to ensure that parties are working from a common reference system and one that's accessible for all participants and those observing the process. And I and other planning barristers have been working on the concept of a digital bundle with a continuous pagination, which is standard in the courts. And of course, if that was implemented, that would revolutionise inquiry documentation. Yes, and I think undoubtedly it is the case that we're moving to more electronic documents. But for anybody out there, including any inspectors uh, listening, who um, don't really want to lose the hard copy documents because of all the highlighting and the post-it notes, uh, well, I have to say I've used hard copy documents all the way through this inquiry and uh, I'll continue to do so. Um, but there's no doubt the electronic ones certainly assist with public participation. So um, thank you very much, James. Leanne, um, the technical meeting, I've mentioned we've got one tomorrow. What, what happens at the technical meeting? So, of course, because this technology is going to be new to so many people involved, and we have to remember, I think, as well, that you're going to have people involved in, in inquiries that maybe may not have been involved in inquiry at all, at all before. Um, it's really important to have a test event, and PINS, I think, has been really good and eminently sensible in arranging these. It's an event that takes place with all of the main parties a week before the inquiry is due to open. And what that does is it allows all of the participants to test out um, their digital connections and the, the procedure that they would be going through um, wherever they're located in order to access that virtual inquiry. So the case officer will confirm the date with everybody and the time for the test event prior to it and send out an instruction email that enables everybody to know what they're going to expect of the event and how they can join the test. So, Chris, as you've said, our first one's tomorrow. Um, we therefore had that instruction email. So we know that events normally are set to take around 30 to 45 minutes. I have to say I have heard from somebody else that theirs took around two hours. But I think that's because, of course, a technological issue did arise with them and that needed to then be, be remedied. But ordinarily, um, 30 to 45 minutes um, seems like a fair amount of time. PINS advises ahead of the event that, of course, parties familiarise themselves with the functions of the technology that they're using just to try and speed up that test and ensure that everybody's ready for it. Um, people should, of course, switch off their um, cameras if they have a slow connection and that will help that event to push through and actually for the live event as well. Uh, people can join via telephone um, just as they can for the actual event, um, either if they don't have the capacity to use video or if they feel uncomfortable with that. Um, we are being advised to attend that virtual event 15 to, to 30 minutes beforehand for obvious reasons we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to access um, and be ready online for that event to start and what will happen then is once you have accessed prior to the start time the case officer will then admit you when ready so you'll all go into to what's referred to as a silent lobby um, waiting for that event to start when we actually then have the test it's inspector led and, and as usual parties invited to speak as and when the inspector feels it's appropriate so I think that's a really sensible course of action for PINs to take, Chris. Yeah, and indeed throughout the whole process, you go into that lobby uh, and then the inspector is brought in at the, the end of that stage. And um, uh, this week it was Helen Skinner who was uh, meeting us all in the lobby and saying hello and then asking us to turn our cameras off. So um, next move to the, the technology. James, what is the technology that PINs are using for the virtual inquiries? So, Chris, um, simply put, they're using uh, MS Teams, which is a very user-friendly interface. It's got a certain formality over Zoom, and the functionality is very strong uh, with easy one-click sign-in, screen share, and, of course, many other features. Yeah, and uh, to be clear that PINs have made it um, very, very uh, much 
the case that they will not allow people to use chat. So you're not allowed to use chat. The inspector won't use it um, and the inspector won't look at it. So there are functions that they can't disable, uh, but um, they don't want people to use those either. Right, now, next I'm just gonna mention about the location of the team and the witnesses. Now, in our inquiry, we had two different approaches this week. Uh, I had most of my team here in chambers with me. I found that extremely useful. We were, of course, social distancing and there was hand sanitizer everywhere. However, um, it is really useful to be able to talk to your team as it is in a normal inquiry. Um, in contrast, the council were doing it with everybody in different places, although a couple of the officers, not the witnesses, were in the council offices. Um, it obviously depends on people's circumstances, whether people are at risk, um, and also their appetite uh, and appreciation of the risks. But um, it is a matter for you. PINs are not dictating how an appellant or a local authority or indeed how anybody participates in this event. Obviously, the inspector is remote and the inspector, uh, certainly at our inquiry, was operating from home. Um, it becomes increasingly uh, easier to work together with the social distancing reduced uh, as of this weekend. Um, but uh, I have to say, I think there were very significant benefits to having the team largely in one place. Now, back to, to James and um, tell us a little about how we've been communicating um, as a team uh, during the course of the inquiry. So um, with this kind of communication, it's really important to plan it in advance. I think it's also helpful to distinguish different scenarios. So you have notes to counsel during the examination of witnesses, which need to be short and focused. And outside that, um, notes, general notes uh, to a council and the rest of the team, which cause maybe longer. And there's also the additional issue of ensuring that the witness who's on the stand is not contacted by electronic means of any form. So for short form messaging, um, we found that the best route is using WhatsApp, which is effectively like a digital post-it. And for longer form messaging, conventional email. The advantage of WhatsApp is that it's single channel, so it doesn't get mixed up with other email and it encourages shorter, more focused messaging. However, of course, it is somewhat informal and uh, the odd emoji may find its way into the flow of uh, notes sent within the team. In future, I, I can see teams setting up their own uh, individual messaging system, perhaps using Slack or some other um, uh, contemporaneous messaging system. Now, a key issue that I referred to before is keeping the witness off any WhatsApp messaging system whilst they're giving evidence. Now, that can either be achieved by simply asking them to put their phone in another room, um, but uh, some others, including you, took a stronger line and took the whole team off the WhatsApp uh, for the duration of that evidence. Yeah, and I think that's really important. So the, the WhatsApp was really useful to talk to the team um, when the witnesses on our side aren't giving evidence, but there's no doubt that um, you want to not only ensure there isn't any inappropriate communication, but also that that is very obvious to everybody, especially members of the public who are watching. So all electronic material was turned off. And in the breaks, actually, we left the cameras and the microphones on. As the barrister, I sat, uh, uh, and was visible. Um, all the witness was sat and visible at all times to see that there was no communication. The witnesses didn't use the computer in the breaks, not because th they would want to, but because of the impression that might give to members of the public. And I think that's a really important thing for people to watch. I don't think PINs will insist on this, but I think parties who want to demonstrate that they understand where the sensitivities lie in the use of this virtual format um, are able to demonstrate that and be able to show everybody just how careful they're being about the communication. Right, um, now, in terms of um, the ability to involve third parties, James, your observations on, on what we've experienced these last two weeks? Yes, Chris, so what I've seen is that third parties have so far tended to group or collect their submissions um, with one spokesperson, for example, a parish councillor. And so what that's meant is there's been relatively few interested parties 
who actually uh, speak. However, inspectors have been very open in allowing members of the public uh, to ask questions of witnesses, even if they don't have Rule 6 status. And that has worked fine if those questions to members of the public are short and focused. Um, some of the questions, just as in a physical hearing, have tended to veer uh, to more towards submission than a question. But the party, the third parties have been very quickly steered back onto uh, conventional process and actually asking a question of the witness. So I think that fears that the process would be slowed down or overtaken by third parties have so far um, proved uh, unfounded. And overall, the involvement of third parties has been almost equivalent in scale and form as in a physical inquiry, in my experience. Yeah, I mean, what, one issue is obviously PINs have uh, chosen teams to allow people to join by telephone. But obviously, if you're on a telephone, then there are charges uh, for being on the telephone. So we've had people who do... Um, come in and then drop out of the meeting uh, at fairly regular intervals. And that obviously leaves a message and that can cause disruption to when a witness is answering a question or an advocate is asking it. Um, if we just move on then to the issue of technical problems, you will have technical problems, that's almost certain. And um, there are various things that are likely to happen. I have to say, coming into chambers, alleviated all my concerns about the technology because it was no longer my problem. I could concentrate on the case and we have IT people here to support us, um, as well as all the other people assisting on the admin of Chambers. Um, but if you are doing it at home and it cuts out, it's not necessarily uh, something to worry about. If you're the advocate or the witness, then obviously that's going to cause some concern and inspectors have left the meeting left the inquiry um, so that uh, they always have those representatives from both sides and the witness uh, on the screen and being able to be listened to if they're present. Um, but uh, if somebody drops out, as happened with uh, myself when I put a load of whole heavy files on top of the keyboard and caused uh, my team to be cut out, um, then the reality is that you, the inspector will leave uh, and wait till you're reconnected and that's when you go back through the lobby system. I have to say the, the technology problems were there throughout, uh, not persistent, not disruptive, but they are uh, there. And if for anybody who says, well, this is how it's going to be done in the future, I think they'd need to reflect really carefully because you don't have any of that at a normal inquiry. I think it's fine to involve people in this process electronically as part of the inquiry package. Uh, but to imagine that we should be doing this um, when it's far better to do it in a single room where everybody's present uh, is blindingly obvious when you come across some of these technical problems. Right, now I'm going to turn to the issue of giving evidence. Uh, I have to say that um, the way in which the evidence was given uh, and the way in which the cross-examination evidence in chief proceeded led me to conclude that it wasn't really any different from a normal inquiry. Leaving aside those occasional technical issues, uh, we were using in chambers screens that you would largely go into a pub and watch football on, which we can do on Saturday apparently. Um, and therefore, the image of the person that I'm cross-examining, uh, for example, Nick Ireland uh, from Iceni, was as if he was in the witness box um, in front of me, possibly even a bit larger. And so um, I didn't find it disruptive. But that's the position from um, the advocate's point of view. Uh, we've got Christian Lee, or I hope we've got Christian with us. Uh, and um, uh, we want to ask Christian um, about his experience and to speak about how he felt it. So Christian, are you with us? Uh, yes, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Recovered from the inquiry? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. a good night's sleep. <laughs> yeah, you still got my closing submissions to go, but we, we, sh we should get that done in three hours. Um, right, tell us how it was for you. What was the experience like? Um, I think Generally, as you as you say, it it, it felt quite normal, and, and I wasn't really expecting it to. Um, the two main um, differences were were the technology um, points. I think I my technology dropped out um, at one point during the cross examination, um, but as you say, 
um, PINs have, have dealt with that quite effectively. Um, and they basically called an adjournment at that point, and then, then we went to lunch, so it, it, it wasn't a problem. Um, the other point is, and it's it's really a point that, that we're all kind of becoming used to in, in the current new normal, really, is, is the screen time. Um, it, it, it is quite intense to be on screen for a long period of time, and I think it is more intense than being... Um, than giving evidence in in person, um, but but pins have quite effectively timetabled the inquiry to ensure that there are breaks um, quite regularly during the day, um, and in our inquiry they 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 aim to adjourn the, the inquiry at three thirty every day as well, which is which is useful. So yeah, that that's my uh, experience really. Yeah, and I, I have to say those breaks, uh, we had an hour, we started earlier at 9.30, started on a Monday because nobody's traveling anywhere. Um, and uh, we had an, a, a half an hour break and then an hour and a half session before lunch. Um, and that half an hour break uh, is designed specifically to give us a break from the screen. Although if, you, if you're in Birmingham City Centre like I am, it gives you time to go and get a prep coffee. Um, and then um, in the afternoon, we just had one session. And I have to say that felt like a very pleasant inquiry day um, and uh, to finish then. But you are getting tired. There's no there's no two ways about it. What about the questioning? Um, I, I should emphasize that uh, you lost your connection, not by pulling out the wire when you faced a difficult question. <laughs> uh, but um, how was it when you were being questioned? Did it feel did it feel at all different? Um, no, not really. Um, it, it felt very much like like being in the room. Um, it, it was uh, slightly strange at, at times when um, the opposing barrister's technology dropped out and and his um, uh, video needed to be turned off. So I was being asked questions by someone that I couldn't see, uh, which was a little bizarre. Um, but but no, generally speaking, it was it was fine and it felt very much like a normal inquiry. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think he was in a different location this week, leading to uh, suggestions that barristers will be doing their cross-examination from their Tuscan villas. Uh, that is just a terrible rumour uh, and uh, not at all true. But um, good. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think it was remarkably similar, wasn't it, really, in many ways? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Well, Christian, thank you very much for joining us. And, um, and uh, we're back to the inquiry straight after this. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to Jack because uh, that's enough about an inquiry. Many, many more cases are dealt with by way of hearing. So, Jack, tell us about your virtual hearing that took place this week. Thank you, Chris. Um, on Monday, I had my first virtual hearing. It was a modest appeal in respect of six, sorry, 10 self-built dwellings. The local authority was Witchhaven District Council in Worcestershire and I was for the appellant. It was due to take place in May, but was adjourned by virtue of the lockdown. I told my planning consultant to tell PINs that we were happy for the matter to be determined as a virtual hearing. Um, I didn't expect anything to come of it, but then out of the blue, PINs sent an email saying there'll be a virtual hearing in our case in a fortnight. Um, a short case management conference took place the week before. This took about half an hour. Its purpose was to familiarise ourselves with the Microsoft Teams platform, um, agree that the matter could be dealt with in a day, um, agree the running order, and also determine whether any members of the public or third parties were intending to attend. Um, the virtual hearing began at 11.30 in the morning on Monday. The appellants team were all sat in the planning consultant's office we sat at three different tables at different corners of the room. The two planning officers were sat together in a room at the council building. The inspector was David Richards, who was at home, and there was a single member of the public who attended the whole event. It was a fairly crunchy appeal, which turned on matters of planning policy rather than allegations of environmental harm. The key issues in the case were twofold. Firstly, was the tilted balance engaged on account of the fact that the council didn't have its own self-build policy within its development plan? And secondly, to what extent was the council meeting the demand for self-build? Um, there's an argument as to whether um, planning permissions purporting to grant self-build could count if there's no condition or unilateral undertaking 
um, to enforce them. Uh, the hearing comprised three sessions, 11.30 till 1, 2 till 3.30, and then 3.30, 3 3.50 to 20 past 4. Um, a PIN's IT officer was there at the start to greet us and make sure that everyone was settled. He then disappeared when the hearing got underway. Um, if you were not speaking, you were muted. If you were not involved in that particular topic, you were asked to turn your video off. If you wanted to come back on a point, you use the hands up function. Um, the four of us in the appellants team all use earphones to reduce distracting feedback. And we communicated simply by talking amongst ourselves when we were all muted um, or by passing notes. So in many ways, intra-team communication was actually easier remotely than it is a case um, in conventional in-person hearings. It's certainly less conspicuous. And the whole event um, proceeded smoothly, albeit that proceedings were interrupted at one point by the inspector's cat making an unexpected appearance. Um, the screen share function was not used at all. No additional documents were relied upon by the parties during the course of the day. Given the nature of the controversy, the hearing was a focused affair with primary consideration being given to particular policies of the development plan, um, appeal decisions and the party's respective appeal statements. Um, notwithstanding the fact that officers were sat in the heart of the council building, they experienced some intermittent Wi-Fi issues. The inspector was keen to keep the show on the road. Given that the inspect this was the inspector's very first virtual event, I was pleasantly surprised that he took such a pragmatic approach to those issues. So, for example, if the screen of a particular participant froze, he carried on, provided the audio was unaffected. At the night before the hearing, the council provided comments on the draft unilateral undertaking. The lateness of the document caused us some problems. Again, the inspector dealt with the matter pragmatically. He took up my suggestion to kick the matter off so that the appellant was given the opportunity to provide a revised unilateral undertaking within seven days, then the council to give comments seven days after. Um, we made a cost application. This didn't take up any time at the hearing, as at the CMC, the inspector had indicated that he wanted the matter to be dealt with in writing. So that's what we did. So what did I make of my first virtual hearing? Um, four points occur. Um, firstly, um, I regard it as a very positive experience. It worked well, and I understand that all parties had confidence in the process. Secondly, in most important respects, it operated as a normal hearing, albeit that the core participants were in three separate bubbles. Thirdly, I think upon reflection, we didn't make full use of the technology available, such as the screen share function. But I think this is more a consequence of the particular subject matter of our appeal, which didn't lend itself so much to that than um, a sort of in inherent scepticism on our part. Um, I think the final observation I have is that the hearing itself took about as long as I would have expected it to have done had it taken place in person. So whilst occasional Wi-Fi interruptions slowed us down a little, correspondingly, speaking to a screen encourages concision and is a verbosity repellent. So overall, in my view, it was time neutral. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, very good, Jack. Yeah, actually, that development uh, you were promoting is just around the corner from my mum and uh, uh, she would have, uh, I'm sure, gladly participated. Uh, she's 80 years old, but she's perfectly able to use a computer. She's constantly all over my Facebook page. So she demonstrates <laughs> that to me every time I say something. Um, good, and uh, just to be clear, the arrangement you had then was your team were together, is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, now, Erin, I don't know if you can hear me. We're getting technical support this morning from Erin, but we've got a, a couple of uh, pictures of the virtual inquiry that James and I did this week. Um, and uh, if they don't come up, you can find them. Oh, uh, here we go. This should work. There. Now, lots of comments about this, uh, suggesting that it looks like something from Star Trek, uh, that I'm playing Captain Kirk. Uh, people wondering why everybody's a bit further away from me than normal, but that's just because of my boxes all round. Uh, but that's how we did it. Um, uh, James, there you can see in the foreground, and then other experts uh, at, sat at their tables. 
Uh, and we found that worked perfectly well. One of the things we were able to do when the other side were talking was mute uh, so as not to cause any noise. And then we could just talk normally. So I agree with you, Jack. The ability to communicate um, is actually enhanced this way round. Although, obviously, <clears throat> if you were laughing at a particular answer, then you have to do what premiership footballers do and make sure they can't see what you're saying um, or there's any lip readers. Um, so just be a little bit careful about um, the extent to which you're reacting on screen. Um, and also uh, how the screen itself looks, Erin. I don't know if we've got a, the other picture there of how the screen was split up. Um, there's the inspector, uh, Mike Hayden, on the uh, left-hand side. My opponent, Simon Pickles, in his attic uh, at the top. And then there's my witness, um, Andy Moja from Tetlo King, um, in another room. Uh, deliberately in another room um, and uh, the camera in that room in Chambers is down on the witness so um, we could all have a good view of him and to check that nobody was around him. So uh, Erin, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, now we're going to move to um, virtual court hearings and Jack, you've had a busy week. Uh, not only have you been doing your hearing but you've been in the High Court um, and on the same side, I think, as Thea. Is that right, Thea? Yep, that is right, Chris. Um, same side, different parties. Um, so this was my second virtual High Court hearing. The first was a Section 289 challenge to an enforcement notice in May. Um, now, this case that Jack and I were involved in at the start of the week was due to be heard in April, but the claimant's barrister had symptoms of COVID uh, at that stage, unfortunately, so it was pushed back until Tuesday. So this was a, a full day judicial review in front of Mr Justice Robin Knowles and it was brought by a parish council who were challenging the grant of planning permission by the council to my client for housing development on an allocated site, allocated for housing development I might say. Uh, Jack was there for the council, I was there for the interested party and the claim didn't actually raise any novel points of law. There were only two grounds and the second ground was really related to the first. So it, it wasn't a very complicated or difficult case, which probably made it ideal for this um, format of hearing. Uh, there were two bundles, the hearing bundle and the authorities bundle. And my client actually helped to prepare those because the parish council didn't have a solicitor and it was easier for us to prepare them in line with the advice given by Mr Justice Holgate in April. So they were, you know, the way in which they're paginated, they were hyperlinked so that you could access the documents really easily in that way. Yes. Yeah, so we started at 11 and um, I'm usually for a high court hearing. We had two breaks as well as an hour long lunch. Um, only the judge and the barristers had their cameras and microphones on and everyone else was muted. And um, we all gave our submissions. Then the judge took a 50 minute break and then gave judgment um, by 4.20. Uh, of course, Thea and I um, won. Um, and the issue of costs, yeah, the issue of costs um, was unproblematic because it's an Aarhus claim. So the council's costs were fixed at £10,000. Um, I think Thea is now going to talk about the good, the bad and the ugly. Yeah, um, thanks for that, Jack. Um, so um, in terms of... Uh, the good. Uh, I found both virtual hearings have been quite quick. I mean, Jack said time neutral. I think these were actually probably both that I've been involved in have been quicker than I would anticipate. Um, I mean, I have to say um, it might be because both of the judges in, in both high court hearings I've been involved in are not planning specialists. So there hasn't been a great deal of intervention. Uh, we've kind of just gotten on with our submissions and that's been fine. Um, it might be because people don't really like looking and speaking into a screen for very long. There is something a little bit uncomfortable uh, about watching yourself as you're giving submissions. And in Skype for Business, you're all sort of on screen at the same time. Um, it might be because the electronic bundles are so easy to navigate um, and of course they're streamlined in, in line with Holgate, uh, Holgate's guidance on how these bundles should be working. So everyone can navigate really quickly and everyone knows exactly where they're going. Um, the straightforward point I think is that the format works, the technology works and I genuinely think that there is a place for virtual hearings in the future for applications and perhaps submissions on costs um, so that everyone doesn't have to traipse along to court, which inevitably takes a great deal of time for both solicitors um, and barristers who are attending. 
I can't go, uh, of course, without mentioning the benefits of having multiple screens. For me, I had the hearing bundle on one side, I had the authorities bundle on the other side, and the judge and all the parties in the middle. So that made it really straightforward for me to be able to look at all the documents that I needed to look at um, at the same time. Jax, what's your view on what was really good about the hearing? Yeah, I agree with everything um, you've said. Um, It seems to me that the big advantage of a virtual hearing is that you're given a fixed time slot when the hearing begins. So for a final hearing, this wouldn't make much difference as your hearing will probably be the only matter in the judge's list in any event. But if you have a shorter hearing, such as a permission hearing, they tend to be block listed and you have to wait at court until your case is called on. So you may get there at the 10 o'clock and not actually be heard until the afternoon. So for us lawyers, the virtual hearing has the advantage of being given an allocated time. And um, for the court service, this is probably viewed as a significant disadvantage because giving each case a set time is inherently inefficient. So if a case settles or finishes more quickly than expected, the judge cannot immediately start on the next case. Also, the judge is denied flexibility, for example, starting one case and then standing the matter down to allow the parties to bottom out another issue whilst they deal with another case and then call that case back on. And the advantage of block listing also is that lawyers waiting for their case to be called have every incentive to use the time productively to try to narrow the issues in a way which is not possible in a virtual hearing. Yeah. Okay. so moving then on to the bad, um, there's a few points. Um, Sitting in my study wearing a suit felt um, horribly unnatural. Um, Taking instructions um, from my client was undoubtedly compromised. Um, This was a really relatively straightforward case, so it it wasn't as bad as it might be. We had a WhatsApp group open um, and although I didn't say to the judge, you know, can I just check my WhatsApp, my lord, at the end of my submissions, I did have a cheeky look to see um, if anyone had anything that that I needed to add that I'd missed. Um, So not so bad in this case, but I think that that could potentially um, be compromised and of course you you miss that interaction uh, of being in the same place as your clients. Perhaps um, the worst was no lunch um, over the road from the RCJ at the lovely Italian. There, I had to just go to my own kitchen, which was naff. But Jack, what did you think was uh, was bad? Yeah, um, well, I think our case, as you said, Thea, was relatively straightforward and the hearing proceeded without a glitch. Um, so the virtual hearing worked very well for us. But it seems to me that it is somewhat of a fair weather friend. So if something unexpected happens, such as an error in pagination of the bundles or, for example, the late realisation that a particular document has been superseded, these are just the sort of bumps in the road um, which we're all used to dealing with on the hoof at court. But it's much more difficult for ev- to do that when everyone is sat in separate rooms. Yeah. I, I mean, the um, the judge actually didn't have my skeleton argument at the start yes, of the hearing. Yes. For some reason, it hadn't made its way to him. Now, of course, if you're in court, you'd, you'd hand it up there and then, and the judge might go away for five or ten minutes to read it. Um, but in fact, we had to, of course, send it by email and then find an appropriate um, point during the day. Now, I mean, it worked because I was third on, but had I been first on, then that would have been quite tricky, and I think that would have caused some delay. Um, but the ugly. Um, now, this might be a little bit unfair, but I wonder if there should be uh, some judicial guidance on where to position your webcam, um, because there are <laughs> there are ugly places that you can position a webcam. And one of them is underneath the computer screen, looking right up at your face. So uh, a, a little tip there for anyone involved in any kind of virtual hearing uh, straight on or above or even to the side is better than having a camera from down there, because that can be quite, quite ugly. Um, Yeah, I um, had a friend who was observing a hearing last week in a class action about insurance companies not paying out on their business interruption policies, which may be somewhat of a cottage industry um, in the years to come for lawyers. Um, But one of the QCs um, who was not involved in a particular section of the hearing appeared to be engrossed with his documents. But because of the angle of his laptop, it revealed to everyone that he was in fact reading a novel. So the moral of the story is be self-aware, both literally and figuratively.
Yeah, a- absolutely. And um, be very careful about what's behind you or what can be seen because it's all recorded uh, as well. And if you are going to look at your phone, be very careful with that as well. Great. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like it went very well and uh, you've won already, which is nice, isn't it? Uh, we don't get that in planning appeals. Uh, they don't announce the winner and then you get the judgment later. So, um well done. Congratulations on, on the success. That was for Roscon, I think. Is that right? The uh, planning permission. And who were you for, Jack? A Melton Borough Council. Borough Council. Well done indeed. OK, well, I think the key, the key lessons from all of this and from all of um, that you've heard this morning is that there really is nothing to fear. This is all incredibly straightforward and um, is also surprisingly similar. I have to say that's how my experience of the last two weeks has been. It is just remarkably similar to what you would expect. We've all got used to Zoom. Uh, I think as far as the inquiries and hearings are concerned, PINs have done a fantastic job. They were, as we know, subject to quite a bit of criticism about the time taken uh, and everybody was drawing parallels with the courts. But I happened to see something uh, on LinkedIn yesterday where uh, I'd written an article about the virtual uh, inquiry and somebody commented, it's a shame other tribunals haven't got as advanced as this. So now PINs are being seen as pioneers. And there's no doubt what they have to deal with and the public participation is very different from uh, the involvement of just lawyers making an application in court. Uh, A much greater parallel is jury trials and they are still highly problematic with the government now looking to abandon jury trials uh, and have a judge and two magistrates, which uh, is um, causing uh, some considerable concerns of those uh, who care about the criminal justice system and how it operates. So um, PINs have come up with a very practical solution. The courts have continued uh, to deal with administrative court hearings, but that's relatively simple, I would suggest. Um, If you have any questions, do ask us. Uh, I'm running a series of articles on LinkedIn about the virtual inquiry. I'm going to do one after this inquiry is finished about um, the practical procedures. Any final comments from the team at all um, on this? Leanne, any any final comments? Not really, please. Thank you. That I probably would want uh, that may be very much appreciated. Uh, obviously, we want to get things moving. We want to ensure that everyone has fair access. And I think the way that it's being dealt with now does ensure that. Yeah. Good. I'm very much looking forward to having you as my junior in the next two cases in July and uh, just leaning across and demanding documents like I always do. Uh, You can't, you can't, (laughs) that's why I want you there. Um, Thea, final observations? Yeah, I I mean, we've had a lot of questions, um, I don't know, um, on on the Q&A about the handing in of documents at an inquiry and whether doing it electronically has um, sort of reduced the incidence of that happening. Yeah, well, I think um, Pinzer were very clear with the inquiries that they didn't want lots of inquiry documents being handed in because of the risk that people wouldn't see them. But I have to say we have still managed to achieve 25 inquiry documents because things arise, things are said, you have to deal with them. But so long as they go into the inquiry documentation and are loaded up, uh, then I don't see any difficulty with why you shouldn't introduce documents uh, despite the best efforts Um, to try and get everything covered beforehand. Um, For example, in our case, um, there was a judicial review to, or or there is a judicial review to the way in which the council are using a memorandum of understanding to divide up the housing distribution figures. That, that, those papers only came to us during the course of the proceedings. uh, So we wanted to introduce them, obviously. And uh, we did do so and there was cross-examination. It didn't cause any difficulty. And if you need a document, for goodness sake, put it in. Don't worry about not putting it in. Um, we've got plenty of other documents, so it's not as if we've not been trying to get everything covered, but things just arise over the course of a two-week case. Um, Jack, any final comments? No, thanks. No? Well, Neil, Neil Pierce has commented that he felt the, the hearing went really well. He was your consultant in the case, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he did a great job. Yeah, I don't know, um, Thea, I, I haven't been watching the q and uh, I'm afraid, this morning, but um, a few people commenting on the technology uh, and breakdowns in uh, the sound. But a- anything else that uh, you want to respond to? 
Um, no, I, th I think I picked up on the, the sort of the giving of, of documents at the inquiry and how that was going to be dealt with. Uh, that seems to be uh, popping up a lot. There's, there's a few more, but I think given the time, perhaps we, we might answer those on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. We'll be back again with episode six in due course. We'll look at the uh, policy exchange documents. Um, and of course, everything is moving so fast in planning. Uh, this is the right sector to be in. And um, it's build, build, build. So until next time, thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.